Hello and welcome to another complete Cambridge IGCSE biology lesson where you'll learn absolutely everything you need to know on topic 16.3 sexual reproduction in plants. As always we'll be following the Cambridge syllabus exactly and we'll cover absolutely everything you need to know for your final exam. For topic 16.3 you need to identify the different parts of an insect pollinated flower, describe the structural adaptations of insect and wind pollinated flowers and investigate the environmental conditions that affect germination of seeds. For extended you also need to discuss the potential effects of self and cross-pollination on a population and describe the process of fertilization in flowering plants. In our last lesson we learned about sexual reproduction which involves the production coming together and fusion of gametes otherwise known as sex cells. In flowering plants male gametes are present in pollen grains and female gametes in ovules. Pollen is transferred from the male parts of the flower to the female reproductive organs in a process called pollination. The nuclei of the male and female sex cells can then fuse together to form a zygote, which develops into a seed. We'll begin with the structures of an insect pollinated flower. The petals are often large, brightly coloured and scented to attract insects for pollination. They are surrounded by a ring of sepals, which enclose and protect the flower while in bud. The stamens are the male reproductive organs of a flower. Each stamen consists of a long, slender stalk called a filament with an anther at the tip. Each anther is made of four sac-like structures in which pollen grains containing the male gametes are produced. When the anther is ripe, the sac split open, exposing the grains. The female reproductive organs are called carpels. Each carpel consists of an ovary, a style, and a stigma. The stigma is a sticky surface that catches pollen during pollination, and the style connects the stigma to the ovary, which contains one or more ovules. Ovules contain the female sex cells. They develop into seeds when fertilized, and the ovary that surrounds them becomes a fruit. Pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from an anther to a stigma. Some flowers rely on insects to transfer their pollen, while others use the wind. When pollen lands on a stigma, the male reproductive material travels down the style and into the ovary, where it fertilizes an ovule. Fertilization can be defined as the fusion of a pollen nucleus with a nucleus of an ovule. This results in the mixing of genetic information and the formation of a zygote, which divides and eventually becomes a seed. Next, you need to describe the ways in which insect and wind pollinated flowers are adapted to their respective pollination methods. Insect pollinated flowers have petals that are often large, brightly coloured and scented to attract insects. Some also have guidelines or markings which are thought to guide insects towards the nectar source. The nectar itself also helps to lure insects into the flower, bringing them into contact with the stamens and stigma. Stigmas have a small sticky surface to catch pollen when an insect brushes past. Insect pollinated plants produce a relatively small amount of pollen. Grains are large, sticky and spiky, which helps them to adhere to the bodies of passing insects. Wind pollinated plants have no need to attract insects and therefore don't produce nectar. For the same reason, petals are either absent or small and inconspicuous. Stamens have long filaments with anthers that hang loosely outside the flowers. The exposed anthers swing freely in the wind, releasing large quantities of pollen. The stigmas of wind pollinated plants also hang outside the flower. They are feathery with a large surface area to catch pollen grains carried by the wind. Finally, wind pollinated plants produce large quantities of pollen. Grains are small, light and smooth, which helps them to stay suspended in the air. Next, you need to investigate and describe the environmental conditions that affect germination of seeds. So germination is the process of development of a plant from a seed. The successful germination of seeds is dependent on a range of environmental factors, including water, oxygen and temperature. Water triggers seed expansion and activates enzymes. Oxygen is needed for the breakdown of stored food to release energy through respiration and appropriate temperature conditions enable enzymes to function optimally. To investigate the effect of water, add cotton wool to three containers and place an equal number of soaked seeds in all three. Keep the cotton wool in container A dry, add a small amount of water to the cotton wool in container B, making it moist, and completely submerge the seeds in container container C. Close the containers and leave at room temperature for several days. The seeds in container A will not germinate due to a lack of water, the seeds in container B will germinate normally, and the seeds in container C may start to germinate but will not be as developed as the seeds in container A. This is because too much water cuts down the oxygen supply to the seed. To investigate the effect of oxygen, add moist cotton wool to two containers and place an equal number of seeds in each. Place a test tube filled with water in container 
container A and one containing alkaline pyrogallol solution in container B. Alkaline pyrogallol absorbs oxygen, creating a low oxygen environment. Cover the containers and leave at room temperature for several days. The seeds in container A will germinate normally, but there will be little or no germination in container B. This suggests that oxygen is needed for germination. Finally, to investigate the effect of temperature, add cotton wool to three containers and place equal numbers of soaked seeds in all three. Place one container in a refrigerator at around 4 degrees, one at room temperature at around 20 degrees, and one in an incubator at around 30 degrees. Leave for several days and measure the length of the roots and shoots. The seedlings in container C will be more developed than those in container B, while the seeds in container A may not have started to germinate at all. This demonstrates that seeds do not germinate below certain temperatures and that the rate of germination increases as temperature increases. Okay, so that's everything for the core section, so we'll move on now to the extended content, beginning with the terms self-pollination and cross-pollination. So self-pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of the same flower or a different flower on the same plant. Cross-pollination, by comparison, is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of a flower on a different plant of the same species. Self-pollination leads to the production of plants with less genetic diversity, since genetic material from the same plant is used to form gametes. This may limit the ability of offspring to adapt to new or changing environments, reducing chances of survival. In certain situations, however, self-pollination may increase the likelihood that a population survives. A flower's own pollen falls directly onto its stigma, allowing the plant to produce seed even when pollinators are scarce. Finally, you need to know a little bit more about fertilization. So when a pollen grain is transferred to a stigma, it absorbs some liquid from the sticky surface and a tiny tube called a pollen tube begins to grow from the grain. The tube grows down the style and into the ovary and then into an ovule through a tiny hole called a micropyle. A pollen nucleus travels down the tube and into the ovule where it fuses with the female nucleus to form a zygote. Well done, you've just covered absolutely everything you need to know on topic 16.3, sexual reproduction in plants. If you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate your subscription and I'll see you next time for topic 16.4, sexual reproduction in humans.